Hi there, Chris here. I'm getting ready to quilt my double wedding ring quilt, and I'm going to show you how I do that, how I get it basted onto my long arm, and then how I'm going to bind it with bias binding. Basically, I'm going to treat it as if the edges are flat and just do an edge to edge. That does mean, though, as I baste it, I will need to baste along the edge, and I'll need to baste fairly close so that as the foot goes over the edge, it doesn't fold the fabric in on itself. All right, let's get it basted. So I have my halfway marked on my frame, and then here is the halfway point of the quilt. I have also basted on the batting, and I basted it with the red thread that I'll be quilting with so I can see it, and I'll use that to line up the top of each peak so that I know that the quilt is loaded square on the frame. I don't normally pin as I baste on the long arm, but I will today. I'll just pin each one just to make sure everything stays in place as I go through basting it. So these are large corsage pins. They're a heavier gauge, but that allows you to use the pin to push back up through the fabric since you can't really get your hand down there to help guide it. And I'm going to draw up my thread. And I have my machine set on four stitches per inch, so quarter inch stitches. And I will just slowly go around the edge, pretty close to the edge, like a sixteenth of an inch to an eighth of an inch. This is just the basting. And as long as you are within your quarter inch seam for your binding, it's all going to be hidden anyway. But you don't want to be too far from the edge so that the foot would catch it and fold it over. If you were a full quarter inch, then that quarter inch would fold in and then it would be seen. So we just want to go really close to the edge all the way around this top edge. Just take your time. I'll remove my pins as I come to them. So I decided to go with a red thread because I want the thread to blend away in the center parts where the crush colored fabric is, just to keep that somewhat calm in an otherwise very busy color scheme. Because I could have really quilted with any color. Every color is represented in this quilt. Now for the quilting pattern, I've chosen this one, which is called Biggie Smalls, and it's got both big and small circles in it. And the way it connects, I think will just give a nice all over texture not be too distracting, I'm hoping. I have set the pattern height for six inches, so it should be a good size quilting motif. It shouldn't be too dense, I'm hoping. This is the first time I've used this pattern, so I'm still playing around with it. So I've got it all set up, and now I will start sewing in my zones. 
the quilting's all complete. Now I need to trim up the sides, but I can't use my normal rotary cutter and ruler since I don't have straight edges, so I am going to have to cut this one with scissors. And now that the scallops are all trimmed, it's time to cut our bias binding. Now, I don't know exactly how much binding I need. The quilt itself is about 75 by, I think, 95. And I could do the math, but because it's scalloped edges and not just a straight edge, it's going to need a little more binding. So I'm just going to make a bunch of binding and hope it's enough. So since I used the AccuQuilt to make the actual quilt, I am going to be using my AccuQuilt to also make the bias binding. So this is my two and a half inch strip cutter, and it's pretty easy to make bias binding with your strip cutter. So let me show you how to do that. So to start, we're going to cut a piece of fabric that is 16 inches by the width of fabric. Depending on the width of your fabric, you will probably want to cut off the selvage edges before you do this. I'm going to leave them on. I think it'll be okay. So we're going to start by unfolding our fabric. And on the two edges, you're going to fold one side up to meet that cut edge. And on the other side, you'll fold it down at a 45 degree angle to meet the cut edge. The two folds should be parallel to each other. And then we are going to bring those up so they create a continuous line. Then we're going to bring these edges in. So you're making a neat little envelope here. And we're going to line that up with the die. Put on our cutting mat. And run it through the AccuQuilt. All right. So now we have our bias strips. Some of them will be kind of short. I try to avoid having these as part of my binding, but I will set them aside just in case I need more. And then this piece is a little wide. This is the off cut. So I'm going to run these through again, make sure that they are covering the blades. Add those to my pile. Now an alternate way to make bias binding would be to cutting it with your rotary cutter. This can be a little more tricky, but what I usually do is start by folding a 45 degree angle into your fabric. And this could be any size of fabric. 
So I have a 45 degree line on my mat right here. So if I line this up, I can fold it to match that line. Then I'm going to trim right along that fold. Now I have these two pieces. I'm going to layer them on top of each other, lining up this angle. And now I can just cut two and a half inch strips like normal, but following the angled edge instead of a straight edge. and then just continue down your piece. Okay, now I am going to go through this and cut off anything where the selvage is showing. And also any edges that aren't a 45 degree, usually it comes to a point, but I want just a 45 degree angle on that. All right, those are all cut and trimmed and ready to join. I will be joining obviously on the 45 degree angle. That really does help reduce bulk in your binding. So when joining at the 45, when you line up your pieces, you should have about a quarter of an inch overhang on each side. And where your stitching starts and stops should be right in that V. That way, when you open up your strip, it is perfectly straight. One thing I like to do with the needle down line up my pieces and put the needle right in that V so I can make sure that lines up and then the edge is with my presser foot. So I have my quarter inch. And then when you open it, you have a continuous line on top and bottom. All right, that got me about 460 inches of binding. Hopefully that will be enough. So now I'm gonna press all of these seams open and then wind it onto an empty thread spool just to keep it organized. If you like, you can trim off the little dog ears that stick out, but I'm not gonna worry about it. They will all be trapped inside of the binding. Okay, now that we've got our bias binding all cut and sewn together, we can start attaching it to the quilt. I will start by sewing it 
to the front side, just folding it in half and lining that up with the outer edge and sewing a quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna take it over to the machine and show you how to handle the curves as well as the inside corners. All right, so we're gonna start with a tail of about 10 to 12 inches and leave that unsewn. I want to end on the peak of one of the arches. That's where I'll join my binding strips together. So I'll start by attaching on the downward slope of that arc. I almost forgot to install my walking foot, so I'm going to do that real quick. And now I'll sew on my binding with a quarter inch seam allowance. Now when I get to one of the inside corners, what I will do is I will sew about a quarter of an inch past that and then open up the quilt. I want to have the binding be pretty much a straight line, so I'll manipulate the quilt underneath just kind of fold it, stretch it out so that it's a straight line, then continue sewing onto the next arch. And you'll see when you open it up and fold over the binding, it will all fit really nicely. I will be hand tacking this on the backside. And as I do that, I will make sure that the pleat in the inside corner falls just right so it's nice and flat. So I'll just continue on around the rest of the quilt until I get back to where I started and I need to join the two binding strips together. I did add a little piece of washi tape there because I kept finding I was sewing along the wrong guideline, so that just helped me keep on track. Okay, so I've sewn all the way back to the beginning. Now I've left about a six or eight inch opening here, and that just will give me room to join my strips together. Now normally, if it's a straight edge, I have a technique I use uh, that works really well, but I don't know how well it's going to work on a curve. So I'm just going to play around with this. I think if I do my measurements all just on the outside edge here, I should be fine. So I'm going to pin the starting tail in place just so it doesn't move. I've got it lined up along that edge. And then on the ending tail, I'll put a pin, but only through the, the binding in the same spot just to mark. So that's where they really should meet each other. Now for measuring, I just like to cut off a chunk of the binding. That way I get a true measurement. And on the beginning strip, I need to measure from that pin to the end where I first started, and then I'll trim off that excess. Then I'll lay my top piece down, and I need to measure the top piece down towards the end. Oh, and I measured that wrong. I actually needed to trim this one at the pin. So there's a total of two and a half inches of overlap. The method I like to use, I always do the same steps just to make sure I don't twist anything, but I will take the binding strip closest to me, the binding I started with, fold it open and place it right side up off to the right side of the quilt. And then the ending tail, I will open up and put right side down and line them up at the 45 degree. I do use pins here just because you're working with a lot of tension and the quilt is going to want to pull the binding. So this will just help make sure everything stays where it's supposed to be. So now I'll go ahead and stitch that. Again, I'm stitching from corner to corner. So the top corner of the underbinding to the bottom corner of the top binding. And now before you trim your fabric away, I always recommend open it up and make sure it's not twisted and that it's the right length. That way, if you need to make any adjustments, you can just rip that seam and you still have some fabric to work with. So I opened it up and everything looks to be aligned really well. So I'll go ahead and trim off that seam and finger press it open. And then I just finished attaching it to the quilt.
Okay, now that all of the binding is sewn onto the front side, we need to flip it around to the back and hand tack it down all the way around. I am going to be hand tacking it because I don't want to have to try and finagle this under the sewing machine. I'm not that good with machine binding yet, so hand tacking it is. Also, when we get to the inside corners here, that takes a little more finessing, and I think it will just be easier doing it by hand. So let's get started. So when you're hand tacking your binding, you want to match your thread color to your binding rather than the backing because you will see a little bit of it on the binding and that way it will blend better. So I will be using the same red that I quilted with. I also find it handy to have some kind of thread gloss or thread wax to help your thread keep from kinking up and tangling as you're sewing. So tacking the binding down on the curved edges is not very difficult at all as you fold it over to the back side, it naturally wants to go along that curve because it's on the bias. So the most common way to tack down your binding is just with a simple whip stitch. So you'll take about a quarter of an inch stitch, you'll go through the backing and then pop up just a few threads into your binding fabric. This will tack it down and you'll only see a little bit of that thread. And that's why it's important to match it to your binding. Now a few tips. Uh, I do recommend using the thread gloss or a thread wax. And when you cut your thread, don't make it any longer than your arm. You want to be able to pull the thread through all the layers in one continuous motion, and that will really help prevent getting knots in your thread. It may mean that you're threading your needle more often, but in the end, it will be less frustrating for you. Also, try not to pull your thread too tight. If you pull it too tight, you'll end up with a gather, and it will also be weaker as you're quilt ages and more prone to snapping. Now as I get to the corner, I'm just going to continue sewing the binding down until I get to that point where I can see my stitches where I attached it from the front side. I have seen some tutorials recommend clipping that corner, so I'm going to give that a try, see if it makes a difference. So to make it a little easier on myself, I will try and move the binding from the front to the back and kind of stretch it out the same way I attached it to the front, and then just continue stitching along. You will end up with some excess fabric in this corner, but that's actually important. If it were to be too stiff and not have any excess, it would become a stress point on your quilt, and that would potentially rip as your quilt is being used. Like if I were to sew that, so it was permanently a miter, that would be a stress point. And as the quilt was used, and tugged on even just a little bit, those threads would pop, possibly rip the fabric. So I am fine having that little bit of bulk right there. It is going to prolong the life of the quilt in the end. And then I'll just keep repeating these steps all the way around the quilt until it is all tacked down. This usually takes several hours to complete, so you can sit down in front of the TV, do little bits at a time, whatever works best for you. As I'm going along, I do check the front side just to make sure I haven't gone too deep to where you can see my stitch on the front. You really should just be catching the backing fabric and the back of the binding. Definitely think I need some more practice with my curved binding. Not so much on the curves, but in the interior corners. They were a little tricky. I saw some other tutorials where they just like cut a little snip in the V and that helped open it up when you're doing your initial sewing. So I might try that next time. I did go back and sew a couple with that. I didn't notice much of a difference, but I think if I started from the beginning that way, maybe it'll make a difference. Thanks for watching.